And in the last session on interviewing, I covered four specific issues in professional interviewing as a journalist. First, perception of intent and competence. And briefly, what I said about that is you are being judged by your questions. So the reaction you may get in an interview may be because of you. Second, only ask questions you can justify. Questions are justified by news values in the public interest, and uh, the justification of the questions gives you the leverage to ask difficult questions. Third, lazy questions. That's how you lose respect. Um, you um, waste time during the interview asking basic factual questions that you could have easily researched beforehand. Um, that, uh, that shows the person you're interviewed that, that you're lazy and gives the interv uh, person interviewed an advantage over you. On the other hand, <clears throat> good research beforehand increases trust and respect for you as a journalist. Fourth, I talked about probing or phishing, and this is different from being lazy. Sometimes you need to ask questions based on what you don't know. And at a later point, I'm going to get to that crucial issue. How do you ask a question that you don't even know is a question about information that you don't even know exists? Um, and so you do that in probing techniques. You basically shape shake the tree to see what falls out and there's skillful ways to do that so uh, now i want to spend time on more specific issues in interviewing number five simple versus complex questions the idea here is to ask as a journalist simple straightforward questions and not complex or multiple questions a basic question is what happened and why it happened. And that often uh, gathers the information for the summary lead in journalism. Uh, a complex question can be asked in a simple way. So if you need to ask uh, a complex, complex question, find a way. Don't overthink the question. Remember, you are not writing an academic essay. One simple question keeps your source focused and keeps you focused. A rookie mistake in interviewing is to ask uh, a complex academic question that will produce an answer too complex and too academic to use for a general audience. And that's, that's part of the adjustment it takes when you're taking a course in journalism in an academic setting like a university. That academic setting that you're familiar with encourages you to look at journalism as another kind of academic enterprise, which it, it is not. It's totally different. Um, but uh, sometimes students, journalism students, get caught in that academic mindset, uh, mindset and, and uh, a need to adjust. So you want a simple, straightforward answer. Asking one simple, straightforward question is a way to focus precisely on the information you want and the quotation you want. You can always ask a series of simple questions but complex multiple questions uh, allow the person being interviewed to pick part of the question to answer and part of the question to avoid at the same time as seen as though the person is answering the question. It allows the complex question allows the person being interviewed to be selective and how he or she is answering the question. And, and people who are experienced in being interviewed by the media will take the opportunity of a complex question to pick what they want to answer and what um, they want to avoid. When you ask a complex question, you can get a complex quotation. And the complex quotation may be hard for you, 
for you to use in your news story. It the complex quotation may have unwanted elements blended into it. So find the simple question that defines the whole story and just pursue that single question. That helps you develop a single narrative and helps give cohesion to the story. And in a minute, I'm going to give you some specific examples of that. Um, now, there are times when you find journalists asking complex or multiple questions. That usually happens during a scrum, which is uh, a word for a, a group of, of journalists uh, in an impromptu situation interviewing somebody or in a press conference. And in, in a scrum or press conference, you are in, in a group of journalists and everybody wants to ask their own question. So there's a limited opportunity for you to ask a question. You may get, uh, you may only get the chance to ask one question in the scrum or the press conference. So for that reason, in that situation, a journalist will ask one question with multiple parts. Uh, and journalists typically like to claim the right of a follow-up question. Now, there, there is no legal right to a follow-up question, um, but you can always try to claim that you have the right of a follow-up question. The person being interviewed at a press conference at a scrum may not allow a follow-up question, particularly if, if he or she thinks it will get he or her in trouble. So I think you're familiar to watching scrums and, and press conferences, and, and you see what happens. Um, the person being asked the questions gets to pick who, will a, who he or she will allow to ask a question and who or she uh, he wants or she wants to ignore. And if you watch some of the uh, press conferences with uh, U.S. President Donald Trump on the previous four years, you saw uh, times when uh, Trump was being very combative um, in, in, in the questions, um, uh, attacking uh, the journalists uh, for what he would call a nasty question, um, refusing to allow somebody a follow-up question, um, you know, picking and choosing who, uh, who he wanted to ask him questions. Now, remember I said, I just said, ask one question, uh, ask one simple question. And there are two advantages of asking one simple question. One, so the answer to one simple question can create a coherent narrative, and I'm going to explain what that means. And two, um, a one simple question makes a good use of time. So, for example, if you ask a series of different unrelated questions, you don't get a narrative. You get a jointed series of answers, and it does not build to one story. And that's a rookie mistake. So I observe in, in times in this course uh, when we've been able to simulate a scrum and that have all the students in the class um, asking questions um, of, of a speaker. And after they've asked their questions, um, uh, maybe there's a 15 minute period, 20 minute period for the scrum, um, uh, the, uh, I'll have the speaker debrief the students on how he or she felt that they did. And then I'll have the students try to write a story from their notes. And what typically happens in that kind of a lab exercise is that when students sit down to write the news story, they'll realize that they didn't ask all the questions that they should ask, that they should ask. So they have incomplete notes and, and as in a journalism situation, the speaker is gone and, and you can't recover from that or it's hard to recover from that. I also observe that um, students um, will ask multiple questions unrelated questions and that when they sit to write down a story they find that the unrelated answers don't allow them to build a coherent narrative a single coherent story so you are anticipating when you're interviewing somebody writing uh, one 
coherent story and your interviewing process and your questions need to produce that. So that's what I mean by saying one simple question can lead to a coherent narrative. And how it does that, the one simple question starts the interview and subsequent questions build on the initial question and amplify the initial question. If the, if the person says something unexpected, there's an opportunity to, for follow-up questions um, in the same direction. Um, I mentioned the time factor. Um, so uh, uh, let me ask you, how much time do you imagine you need for an interview? You're going to be doing interviews in this course. How much time do you think you need for each interview? Uh, a simple question makes good use of time. Now, important people and busy people don't want to give long interviews. They are likely to give you an hour-long interview or a two-hour interview. So you need to go into the interview focused and time conscious. And that's part of the negotiation of the interview. And at a later session, I'm going to talk about how you negotiate an interview. But for now, let me say that if you get the interview with an important person or a busy person because you say in advance that you want to do a 15-minute interview, then you need to stick to that time frame. When the time is up, you say the time is up. Um, if the person doing the interview likes the interview, he or she may say, well, I've got some more time if you want to continue the interview. And that was my experience uh, as, a, as a journalist, both as a, a staff member and a, and a freelancer. And, and if somebody said, um, 15 or if I negotiate the interview in 15 or 20 minutes, I would uh, watch my watch. I would actually take my watch out and put it there and monitor the time. And when the, when the 15 minutes was up, I would say, well, my, my time is up. And, uh, and very often, uh, somebody would say, oh, well, you know, I'm enjoying this interview. Let's, let's keep going for a while. So imagine you ask one simple, intriguing question on a matter of serious public interest that takes five minutes to answer in depth and all you do is ask follow-up questions for clarification. If the focus of your question is on target, that may be all that you need to write a 400-word news story. If you're really efficient in your questions, in your, your interviewing practice, in 15 minutes, you can get what you need for a 400-word news story. Um, now, Typically, I think your experience is going to be um, in, in this course, uh, doing the assignment, that um, you're going to very, find it very hard to get what you want in 15 or, or 20 minutes. But I'm introducing that now for you to uh, think about it. If the focus of your question is on target, if the person you're interviewing is cooperative and answers your questions, that a 15 minute interview from one question plus follow up questions, maybe all that you need for a 400 word news story. Um, oh, but let, let's imagine another situation. Um, suppose this um, single, very apt, well focused question develops into a 20 minute interview. A 20 minute interview would be a very long for a typical broadcast situation or even a typical 400-word uh, news story. So um, um, if you're into broadcast journalism, um, uh, I know that, and I know there's uh, some of you in this course, uh, that's what you're interested in, uh, either TV or radio or maybe podcasts. Um, um, you may find yourself in situations, particularly with important people or the amount of time that the broadcaster gives you, um, five minutes might might be, the broadcaster might think uh, giving you five minutes is, is a lot. So imagine um, um, what you've got 
to do in terms of focus, in terms of questioning in a broadcast situation to get that five minutes. And in a, in a broadcast five minute interview, um, some of that five minutes may be taken with your, your lead in, um, your, the transitions that you provide. So can you find the right question on a matter of serious public interest that is intriguing and will produce new information and you can choose the right person um, uh, to ask that question. <clears throat> so, um, for example, um, uh, suppose we have uh, another federal election uh, coming up in Kamloops. The conservative incumbent uh, has continued to hang on um, in the federal riding of the Kamloops area, uh, despite the the liberal um, the the liberal uh, success. Um, so uh, imagine that you're doing a a campaign story um, during that before that federal election, um, and you're interviewing a candidate running against against Kathy McLeod, maybe a candidate that is a, a fair decent chance of of winning, um, you could ask that person a what if question uh, before the election. What the what if question could be, what if this person loses the election and uh, instead of winning it, what would this person do? Um, or you could talk, you could interview Kathy McLeod as the incumbent and you could say, what if this opponent um, uh, beats you. Um, what what will you do? Um, you know how will you occupy uh, how you occupy yourself? Um, you know that one question uh, could lead uh, in an interesting direction. And I'm going to talk at at um, uh, at a later time about the um, the, the what if question. Um, right now, I want to go on to number six on my list, dumb questions. Okay, so um, um, typically, rookie journalists are afraid of asking dumb questions. I mean, sometimes they don't know when a dumb question is a dumb question. At other times, they realize that this is a dumb question. And um, in those situations, there may be uh, inhibitions to asking a dumb question. Um, and certainly you want to eliminate dumb questions because um, you're lazy. I mean, you're not, you're not going to be lazy, but um, um, you, know, you shouldn't ask a dumb question because you're lazy. The point I want to make is that dumb questions can be smarter than they actually seem. Dumb questions um, um, can... Um, relax um, the person you're interviewing. They seem like an easy law ball uh, question. And, and so in some situations, a dumb question can be uh, more revealing than the person being interviewed realized. Sometimes dumb questions are useful for clarification. And sometimes the initial dumb question can seem harmless to the person you're interviewing, but the answer uh, leads to tougher follow-up questions. Um, also, sometimes journalists who are wary of a source that has a reputation for lying or being deceptive, um, sometimes journalists will um, start with dumb questions um, that uh, seem to show the ignorance of the journalist, but the journalist actually knows the truth. And from the answer to that apparently dumb question, the journalist can tell how, uh, how honest the source is. Number seven on my list is judgmental and non-judgmental questions and difficult questions. Non-judgmental non questions, that is, the question uh, has no obvious point of view into it, um, no 
ideology in it. Uh, it just, it just obviously, it doesn't have an obvious point of view. There doesn't seem to be a judgment on on the basis of the question. Well, the non-judgmental questions are best for winning trust and cooperation. But there's also an ethical implication that if you represent yourself as a non-judgmental journalist who's just going to report the, the, the truth as best you can and you're going to and you're asking non-judgmental questions there's an ethical implication that that will be reflected in how you write the interview in other words a source will feel betrayed if he or she is believed believe believe she or she is encouraged to do an interview in a non-judgmental context when the journalist intends it as a deception as a trap and the interview will be judgmental and when i say that i think back of my own experience in the newsroom in a daily newspaper it was an open newsroom with uh, everybody's desks nearby so you could hear um what your colleagues were doing on the phone and the interviewing and i remember that the journalist whose desk was behind me i could hear him on the phone um pretending to be non-judgmental and pretending um to set up a non-judgmental interview when it was very obvious when you knew uh this journalist that that was not what he was going to do it it was a it was a trap and it was deception and um and uh, uh people uh react badly to deceptive journalists and 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 this journalist had that problem uh that's called burning your sources um okay and when you burn your source that means that you betray your source um that doesn't mean that you have to be manipulated by your your source it just means that you're honest up front to your source if if you're doing um an interview where you have interviews that are going to contradict this person um you don't pretend that there's going to be nothing in the story that will contradict the person you actually um explain that that you have contrary points of view um the result of that is you're now seen as honest um and you have more material um for that person to respond to now a judgmental question can be justified and useful judgmental questions are important too uh, uh judgmental questions let society decide based on the answer decide in a legitimate moral issue of an, a legitimate uh issue of public interest and a judgmental question can be used to provoke an answer when the question is is justified as newsworthy for example uh questions of morality are by nature judgmental they are generally based on the morality of society and in a democracy uh people who will power and influence are held morally accountable by society so for example donald trump knew when he was campaigning uh to be president of the united states in in 2016 that he would be held morally accountable for more lapses such as having affairs while married to his wife but trump didn't care himself about his moral lapses he did know however that it would affect his public image when he's campaigning to be president in 2016 so his his mistresses were were paid money to keep quiet and and trump's personal attorney michael cohen says in his memoir disloyal which was published last year the memoir 
about Michael Cohen's years as Trump's attorney, uh, Cohen says that he paid the exotic dancer Stormy Daniels to keep quiet um, about Donald Trump. So in some cases, it is justified for journalists to ask judgmental questions that are news for newsworthy and serve the public interest. But it can be difficult to ask these judgmental questions. What journalists typically do then is frame a judgmental question as though it comes from somebody else, uh, not uh, from the journalist. It's the, the, the question is phrased with, quote, people want to know, or quote, people are asking. Uh, it's as though the question um, is is coming from somebody else. It's phrased as though the journalist is not asking the question personally. The phrasing suggests public accountability is the reason for the question, not the journalist. Probably, you know, the most famous example of that and well-known example comes from Mike Wallace, a broadcast journalist who worked for 60 years. Uh, for qu quite a few years on the um, uh, TV investigative uh, magazine, uh, 60 Minutes. Mike Wallace was a very aggressive journalist. And in 1979, he was interviewing the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. At that time, it was a very delicate moment. There were 52 American hostages had been taken from the U.S. Embassy. It was an explosive situation and dangerous because Wallace's questions could have inflamed the Ayatollah. Um, the Ayatollah may have seemed crazy to the Christian West. So Wallace wanted to ask the Muslim Ayatollah if his actions were that of a madman. So he doesn't say, um, are you mad for doing this? You know, how do you explain the sanity of your actions? That's, he doesn't do a, a direct question like this. This is how Wallace asked the question. He said, quote, Imam, President Sadat of Egypt, a devoutly religious man, a Muslim, says what you are doing now is, quote, a disgrace to Islam, unquote. And he calls you Imam, Forgive me, his words, not mine, a lunatic. Okay, and I've even imitated the body language of um, Wallace during that. It's easy to uh, watch um, this, um, the, this video clip online on you, YouTube, and I might play it sometime. But notice the language here. Um, notice how respectful it is. Notice how Wallace deflects um, um, de deflects the question from seeming to come from him, and his even his body language, which you can see on camera as he's asking the question, it's deferential. You know, his eyes look concerned. Um, he uh, puts his hands on his on his uh, chest. You know. Um, uh, giving uh, uh, sincere body language. Let me read that again. What, what he said, Imam, President Sadat of Egypt, a devoutly religious man, a Muslim, says what you're doing now is, quote, a disgrace to Islam, unquote. And he calls you a man, forgive me, his words, not mine, a lunatic. Well, the aggressive Mike Wallace has just asked an offensive question to the Muslim leader of Iran in an explosive situation while 52 um, Americans are, are hostage. Now, you notice how polite um, the offensive question is worded. Um, as I've said, Wallace deflects attention by himself as to make it seem as though another Muslim leader is asking the Ayatollah the question. Notice that the question isn't actually a question. It's a statement, an implied question. Wallace doesn't say, are you crazy? 
It's an implied question. He quotes a statement that will be interpreted as an unexpressed question. Now, um, the translator, um, this, this whole conversation interview with between Wallace and Anatole Khomeini, it was done through a translator. And the translator, when he heard Wallace's question, he didn't want to translate it to the Ayatollah for fear of angering the Ayatollah. Wallace had to insist that the translator ask his question. How did the Ayatollah respond? Well, he attacked, um, he attacked um, the other leader, not, not Wallace. He attacked Sadat. And uh, Wallace wrote later in his memoirs that um, it was the first time in that interview that the Ayatollah looked him in the eye because of the, qu the question. And Wallace says he thought he even detected curiosity in the Ayatollah because uh, Wallace asked the question. Maybe the Ayatollah saw courage in Wallace for asking the question. So the question w was asked, the cameras were rolling, um, the Ayatollah answered that Sadat is not a real Muslim, and that Sadat has united with the enemies of Muslims. And the Ayatollah said that the people of Egypt should overthrow Sadat. Um, two years later, in 1981, Sadat was assassinated. So um, I use that as an example uh, of uh, of a probing question that begins with an apology or sympathy, and you can say, um, and, and, what, uh, 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 and Morales is essentially apologizing for asking the question. You can say, excuse me for asking this, but, and remember, the question must be justified. You need the moral leverage of a justified question. So a typical question like this is, People want to know why. Notice you're deflecting the question to somebody else. Or you can ask um, in the interview, you seem troubled or upset when I asked, did I offend you? And, and that's likely to elicit an answer. Um, or, you know, maybe in a situation you can um, uh, downplay, uh, soft pedal the question. Uh, you might say, um, you, you, you know, you're in an interview and you do a follow-up question and you say to somebody, you said you had a little problem with the police. What did you mean by that? And that's, you know, being able to ask us a sensitive or uh, a difficult question. Often these, um, uh, these situations where you have a, um, a sensitive or a difficult question, um, um, these, um, these interviews are with victims, interviews with vulnerable people, uh, interviews with children. These questions need to be justified to help protect the vulnerability and the naivety um, of sources like this. So uh, one typical rule in journalism codes in situations like these is to minimize the harm of the question on the person and the harm of the public perception of the per person. And as these situations um, that there's an exception to the rule in journalism of not using anonymous sources. That is, um, uh, you determine that because of the real harm, um, the source will suffer um, by coming forth in the interview with the information, uh, a decision is made that's justified um, to give the source anonymity. Another typical rule in journalism codes is to treat vulnerable and naive sources differently from public experienced figures. That is people who've never been interviewed by the media before, uh, people like children who are naive about the consequences of, of being interviewed. Um, in these situations, um, you 
help the source understand the question and understand the effect that the answer could have on public perception of them. And, and children and victims are an, a particularly important category of source that needs extra care uh, during an interview. In the case of children, there are actual restrictions in the Criminal Code of Canada if the child um, is involved in the court case. And uh, later in this course, near the end of this course, I'm going to do a session on media law and ethics, and I can get into more into uh, legal and ethical restrictions. Uh, also, there's restrictions in journalism codes about interviewing children, particularly um, without um, uh, without their parents. So generally, an interview with a child requires a higher level of care and protection of the child. Um, one, one more um, comment about uh, di difficult questions or difficult interviews. Um, if you're going into a difficult interview, um, is it particularly a, a time where you want to consider what's called an icebreaker question? These are inno this is an innocuous social question to put the person uh, at ease to relax the person in the interview. In print journalism, um, the icebreaker question, the answer is simply not used for the story. In a live broadcast journalism, um, um, which is unedited, the icebreaker question um, may be visible for your audience, but it's still useful because people can be nervous in, in broadcast interviews in front of a large audience. Now, print journalism interviews have the advantage that they're typically just the journalist and the person being interviewed. So the person doesn't feel the pressure at that point as intensely of an audience. And a broadcast situation is different, particularly if it's done in front of an audience, even if it do isn't done in front of a live audience, um, the person being interviewed is, is generally aware that there may be a lot of people watching that can make the person nervous. So an icebreaker question can be very useful on air. It puts the person at ease and putting the person at ease makes the uh, interview work better. Um, but what you, you can make the icebreaker question uh, a bit more useful if you can, uh, if you can put into it ingredients um, that uh, show that you prepared by researching the background of the source ahead of time. Okay, number eight on my list um, is the category of directive and non-directive questions or open and closed questions or general and specific questions. So typically in um, discussions about interviews and interview technique and questions across different disciplines, because remember, journalism isn't the only discipline um, where um, interviews uh, take place. And, in, uh, and previously, uh, when I introduced the session on journalism, I talked about the other uh, situations, uh, other disciplines you know, police investigations, um, uh, examining a witness, uh, a lawyer examines a witness in court, uh, a therapist um, is interviewing a patient, a doctor's interviewing a patient, uh, a researcher is gathering uh, information. Um, you know, in, in, the, uh, in many other disciplines, uh, interviews are part of the professional activity and not just journalism. And so in those situations, um, a, a typical distinction is made between directive and non-directive questions or open and closed questions or general and specific questions. Each of those two has different uses and, be sh should, use, and should be used at different times for different purposes. In an interview, you might want to use both directive and non-directive questions, or given the purpose of the interview and the circumstances, you might prefer one type of question over the other, directive versus non-directive. Once 
you learn the difference between directive and non-directive questions. They help you assess the problems quickly during an interview and allow you to adapt. So you can anticipate in an interview whether you need to be favoring directive or non-directive questions. And when you're in the interview and problems develop in the interview, you can decide whether a directive or a non-directive question will allow you to adapt quickly to the problems. This is particularly important if you're doing a live broadcast, when you're trapped in real time and you don't have the luxury of editing the interview later. You, print journalists have that luxury. If the, if the answer to a question flops, uh, the journalist, print journalist doesn't have to put it in the story. Uh, in a live broadcast, it's there. The mistakes are there. The flops are there. So uh, a live broadcast is really interviewing at its most intense. And you have to be able to adapt quickly in a live broadcast. Now, um, uh, in a journalism course, um, um, at times we may need to simulate this difficulty and the need to be able to think quickly and to adapt uh, in an interview. And at times when I've been doing this course, I've had an assignment for students to do a recorded interview and then submit for marking the unedited transcript. In an unedited transcript, you can't escape from your errors. So that assignment meant the students had to be alert and adaptable during the interview as they would in a live broadcast or in the Q&A format. Q&A is question and answer format, um, where uh, the, um, uh, the transcript of the interview is published in print form. So that assignment gave the students a chance to reflect on how they actually conduct an interview and how they could improve the interview. And at years, even years before, I did the assignment as a video recording. And then in the class, we sat down and we watched every student's uh, uh, interview. Um, but, but that was very time consuming and um, the printed Q&A transcript uh, worked better. So students um, then had to submit an unedited transcript um, for marking and that gave more evidence of what was happening in the interview. And, and students, uh, when they looked at their own transcript, uh, students were pretty good at, at realizing what could be improved. I'm not doing that transcript assignment um, uh, this time in this course, although interviews are required in this course and you're doing a, a progress report on your interviewing, which um, is, is an opportunity um, uh, to see how your interviews are progressing. Uh, and, and like I say, uh, when I was doing this transcript assignment, uh, the students often saw um, the, uh, the problems. And wh when we did, uh, wh when we examined this, students often commented how they realized from their own transcript that they didn't ask the obvious follow-up questions. And there were usually two reasons students gave for not asking the obvious follow-up questions. First, they felt too intimidated and shy and inexperienced and didn't want to stop a rambling, irrelevant answer that was just eating up their time and, and not producing results. Or two, they felt so committed to the script of their written questions that they didn't want to depart from that script and they lost the opportunity to ask important follow-up questions. It was only later when they examined their own transcript that they could see this, uh, that they could see um, what has happened. So um, you want to identify quickly during the interview the problems of the way your source answers questions and you want to adapt and change quickly in the interview. Um, so for example, if, if the subject tends to give only um, uh, general absolute answers that aren't what you need, um, then you need to uh, change to a directive question. Or if the source tends to, to give only narrow, limited answers, 
then you need to switch to a non-directed questions. Okay, you know, what, when are they useful, when are they not useful? Uh, directed questions are useful in establishing a factual basis. Once you have a factual basis, you can then proceed to larger issues. For example, if you are dealing with uh, somebody who is evasive, who makes or who makes large general absolute statements, um, you don't want to ask non-directive questions or general questions because they make it easier for that person to avoid answering, or they make it easy for the person to make large general absolute statements. For example, when Donald Trump was president, um, he made large general absolute statements that appeal to common sense rather than facts. And common sense or a consensus view can easily be mistaken. And, and what we're watching right now happen in the United States, we can observe a far right fringe in the U United States that lives in a consensus bubble where all their beliefs are confirmed, not contradicted. That in that consensus bubble, um, um, all their biases are reinforced. And Donald Trump and Fox News have been feeding the consensus bubble of the far right. Now, when you watch interviews with, with Donald Trump, he, he tends to refuse to answer directive questions to establish common facts. Um, and remember that you can't force somebody to answer a question and you can't force someone to answer a question the way you want. Um, so there's a problem in those interviews with Donald Trump that he, he, he wouldn't, um, uh, he evaded establishing uh, the common facts. In fact, he denied them. Um, on the other hand, if you're dealing with somebody who is too precise and pedantic and who narrows the scope of the issues too much, then you may want to pursue larger open-ended questions rather than get trapped in answers that are too narrow. So a problem with a di directive question or a narrow answer um, is that it can eliminate something else you want to know. It can create a blind spot. That is the directive question, the specific question allows you to focus the question, and that's a good thing, but the focus can create a blind spot. Um, think of, I'll, I'll use a simple analogy. Suppose you're out in a, a dark night and you have a spotlight. Well, the spotlight, you can shine your spotlight in a direction, like a directive question, and the spotlight will illuminate just a small part of what's in the darkness. But um, that also blinds you to what is outside the spotlight. I have that experience when I think there's a wild bear in my backyard and I want to go out on my porch and shine a flashlight. And uh, believe me, I'm thinking um, the, the bear may be in the dark area. Okay, so that's my analogy um, of a spotlight in the dark on a directive question. Yes, good for illuminating what's in the focus of the light, bad for creating a blind spot. So that's what can happen with a directive question. It can get you the answer because of the sharp focus of the question, or it can ignore something that's outside the focus of the question, the precision of the question. For example, if you ask, if there's enough supply of the COVID vaccination in Canada to supply the scheduled doses for the next two months, the reply might be yes. Then later you find out there's expected to be a shortage in six months. You ask the source why he or she didn't tell you that. The answer is you didn't ask. In other words, specific questions uh, can give an evasive source, an opportunity to um, avoid something uh, the source knows is a problem. Um, by contrast, non-directive questions have both strength and, and, and 
and weaknesses. One strength of the non-directive question, the directive question, is that you can get answers uh, you weren't expecting. You cast a wide net with the question, and you get fish you don't expect. So, for example, to go back to my um, spotlight in the dork analogy, suppose I think there's a bear in my backyard, and I go up my porch with a light that illuminates the whole backyard, and I find out uh, there's no bear, but there's a raccoon. Um, and that, that wasn't what I was expecting, and maybe it's in a part of the backyard I, I wasn't expecting. So the non-directed question is like that, that light that illuminates everything, or like I said, like casting a wide net when you're fishing. You can get answers you didn't even expect were there. So um, you ask specific questions, directive questions, to get details. And there's strength in the details. The details make the story seem real and unique. And you look at the examples uh, in this course of uh, the stories by Marie Colvin and the precise details uh, that she gives you of being on the scene in a con uh, conflict zone. Um, and, and the details are so precise, it makes you feel like you're actually there. Um, um, and, you know, and when I've done um, um, simulated scrums um, um, in, uh, in a class before, and this is a, was an opportunity for students to ask directive and non-directive uh, questions, um, the result was that many of the original answers uh, of, of those uh, interviewed um, uh, uh, was vague and specific, and that was a technique of evasion. Not enough directive questions were asked. The vague answers allowed the politicians to sound great and avoid getting caught in answers that is real problems. Um, so uh, when you're confronted by vagueness, um, pursue it with follow-up questions. Don't give up. Persist until you get specific answers. So, um, you know, get a vague answer. You may say, why did you say that? Can you be more specific? Uh, can you give examples? Um, or you can prompt the person to explain how a specific example you give would fit his or her generalization. So, for example, a politician says he or she believes in democracy. You know, say, oh, um, okay, I'm thinking now, Okay, suppose you're talking to a Republican politician in the United States right now, and you ask that Republican politician, uh, that person gives a vague answer saying, I believe in democracy. Um, so then you could ask if democracy is working well when uh, it elected Donald Trump, um, and then you cite some uh, specific examples, uh, factual examples, of when de democracy has gone wrong with Donald Trump. Um, the point is to get details and get specific details. And sometimes you have to work hard during an interview because there's resistance um, in the person being interviewed uh, to give um, specific details. Uh, giving vague general answers um, is a way to sound good and, and to be evasive. At the same time, so you you know it's at that time um, if you feel you're getting vague answers that you switch to um, uh, you switch to the um, uh, directive questions.